Hi, I'm Seben Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Possible Benefits of Amorphous Core for Active Power Factor Correction Inductor. There is a related video, and here is the link to it. I'm going to print the link in the description section of the video that you are now watching. And also there is a disclaimer here that the magnetic materials, this should be materials, shown in this presentation are for educational purposes only. There is no endorsement or recommendation implied. So here's the outline. There are actually two sections to this presentation. First of all, I'm going to cover what are the requirements or the required specifications of a core for active power factor correction inductor. And then I'm going to compare ferrite versus amorphous core for the purpose of this type of inductor. I'm not going into the actual design of the inductor. Hopefully I'll do it in a forthcoming video. So here's the problem we are talking about. This is a generic representation of the power factor correction circuit. It's a boost converter, in fact. We have here a AC voltage coming in, a rectifier, might be a filter here, which I'm not showing. And then we have a boost converter, there's the output voltage here. And we are actually forcing the current through this inductor to be a rectified sinusoidal waveform. The voltage here is rectified voltage, and I'm, we are forcing the current to be following actually this uh, input voltage. And therefore, at the input after the bridge, we're going to see a sinusoidal current. So this is the principle of active power factor correction. Now we are interested in this inductor. Now the inductor has to fulfill actually two requirements. Number one is not to go into saturation by this high current that we're going to hear, the peak current here. Inductors are built around ferromagnetic materials, and the ferromagnetic material of ferrite or amorphous or any other one would have a saturation level for the magnetic flux density. So we have to make sure that we are not approaching this saturation level, go to up to some B max, such that the inductor will retain its inductance. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be a much lower inductance and we're going to have a high ripple and there might be damage to the system. So first of all, we have this requirement that the B max due to the current, the maximum current, will be below the saturation level. But there is another issue, which is very important now when we are working at high frequency, and that is, we have a ripple of the current due to the operation of the boost at high frequency. Now, this ripple of the current is causing, of course, a ripple in the magnetic flux density, and this is causing losses. So we have to make sure that the ripple of the magnetic flux density, the average, actually it should be average over the cycle, I'm not going into the fine details here, but the ripple should be below a certain, the level that will cause to high temperature, okay? So we have two sort of independent uh, requirements here that we have to fulfill. So let's talk first of all about the relationship here between the current and the magnetic flux density. I'm starting with the definition of an inductance, which is n times phi flux divided by the current, from which we get that the magnetic flux density is the current times the inductance divided by n number of turns and a cross-section area of the core, okay? So therefore, the ripple is related to the ripple of the current. So therefore, the ratio between the ripple of B over B max is like the ratio of the current, a ripple of the current over I max. And then we have to assume a certain level of ripple of current and I'm setting it here in this example 2.2. Now, obviously, if we make it much smaller than that, the ripple will be low, but the inductor will be larger because the smaller the current, the smaller the ripple current, the larger the inductor has to be. On the other hand, a large ripple may cause a corruption of the power factor. We are trying to get a good power factor, meaning that we want this waveform to be close to sinusoidal as much as we can. Now, if the ripple is too high, we might go into discontinuous mode in this region here, and this will actually corrupt the power factor. 
So we have to be careful not to have it too large of a ripple. And again, in this particular presentation, I'm setting it to 0.2. Now this 0.2 is the peak value, so the peak to peak is actually 0.4, that's quite a bit. So the assumption in this presentation is that the ripple of the current or the peak of the ripple is 0.2 of B max. So let's move now to the question of the ripple and what is causing it, okay? Now ripple is actually caused by the voltage, the square voltage across the inductor. During the on time, we have V in. During the off time, we have V out minus V in. This is what we have across the inductor. And this is, of course, causing the ripple. Now, let's talk about the T on time. So during the T on time, the current is increasing. According, of course, this uh, equation of the state's equation of the inductor. And we can work it out that the delta I is equal to this expression. And D on can be found for any given point here. This is a variable voltage. So for any given one, according to this relationship, this is the transfer function of a boost converter, V out over V in one over D off. Or we can express it as D on is one minus V in over V out. And I'm going then to plug it in, and let's not let's skip this part here, and get this expression for the delta i as a function of v in, v out, which is part of the definition of, of d, the duty cycle. And to find out the maximum ripple, I'm taking the derivative here, equating it to zero, and I'm finding, which is very well known, that the maximum ripple is when the duty cycle is 0.5. That is when the V in is half of V out. Okay, V out is fixed because there is a controller that is fixing the output voltage and V in is the rectified voltage. And therefore the maximum ripple of B will also be at the duty cycle of 0.5. So this is just an observation which is very important to know. And then I can estimate from the fact that I know now the ripple and the maximum value, etc., what should be the inductance. And here again, we see that the inductance is inversely proportional to the switching frequency, which, which we know the higher the switching frequency, the smaller the inductance that we need. And this is one reason we like to go to high frequency in reducing the size of the inductor. And from which we can also get the maximum value of the ripple of the magnetic flux density, and this is the expression. This is, by the way, a sort of a outcome of Faraday's law, because here we have the voltage the switching frequency, and this is actually coming from this equation, although I sort of arrived at it from, you might say, Ampere's law. So now we go into the real issue. I'm starting with the ferrous cube material, 3F3, very well known, it's an old material. We have now much better material in terms of lower losses at higher frequency. But I'm just starting with this one just to see what is happening with this particular unit when it is used for the inductor for active power factor correction. So I'm starting with the BH curve and we see that the saturation level is about 300 millitesla. Here is the 100 degrees level here. So 300 is, seems to be like a reasonable number setting for the saturation level, okay? So as we have said, in order to not to corrupt the power factor, I don't want a too large of a ripple, and I'm assuming that the ripple is 0.2. Now 0.2 of 300 is only 60 millitesla, okay? So we are here. And what we see here is that for the 3F3, we are in a pretty good shape. If the switching frequency is 100 kilohertz, we have only 20, well, it says kilogram per meter cube. I like milliwatt per centimeter cube, which is the same thing here, okay? So we are talking about 20 milliwatt centimeter cube, which is very nice. So you can see that we can go up to, say, 400 kilohertz, and everything is in shape. So we can say that 3F3 is actually filling our requirement. Actually, there is a spare here, so everything is, seems to be okay. So let's now move to an amorphous core. 
Now this is an amorphous code by magnetics. It's an old material, relatively old, and it is built by actually wrapping here ribbons like this, uh, tapes, and then cutting it for the gap. So it's a cut C core, as they call it. And this amorphous material has a saturation level fairly high. So we can set the V sat to say 1.3. So we can go up to 1.3 without any problem, meaning that we can satisfy the very high current, or you might say for a given current, the core will be smaller because we can go to a higher B set. But we do have to worry about the losses. So if I'm setting the B ripple to be 0.2 of this level, this will be 0.26. And here are the losses. I can see that we're in bad shape here. For example, if I'm talking about the level of, uh, say, this is around 100 milliwatt per centimeter square, and here it's only 8 kilohertz. If I'll go to 50 kilohertz, then it's 1 watt per centimeter square. This is given in watt per kilogram, which I've converted to something which is, I think, more friendly, watts per centimeter or milliwatt per centimeter. So anyhow, with the 0.26 at 50 kilohertz, it's a fairly low frequency, we're already getting something like one watt per centimeter square, which is a lot. Of course, we can go to a lower B or ripple of a B. We can go to this point here, and of course the losses will be lower. But then, if this is 0.2 of the maximum, the maximum will be much lower, and we are not actually using the fact that we have a high saturation level. So we'll be only here, which is kind of not using the fact that this material has a very high saturation level. So as I've said, the magnetic material is a fairly old material, and here is a more recent material. I'm showing it from this catalog of CEMIC. They are actually a shop selling uh, magnetic ma uh, components. I don't know who is the manufacturer. It is a Chinese manufacturer. I couldn't trace it. But at any rate, these are units which are used for power factor correction. And uh, here are the dimension of it. And we are more interested, of course, in the material and in particular the loss. Now, this material has a saturation level, again, of 1.5 Tesla, like the magnetics, it's an amorphous core. So this is very good. So now, if I'm talking about 0.2 of this value, it's 0.3 Tesla, 300 milli Tesla. And as you can see, the losses will be very, very high here. So I cannot work here. So if I move to 0.1, which is more reasonable, which would mean that I'll be using only 0.5 Tesla max because the max, is according to this relationship I've said, is five times this ripple. Then at 50 kilohertz, I'm already at 270 milliwatt, which is maybe reasonable, but that's sort of the end of, of the story. I mean, I kind of go to higher frequencies, it's a bit just too hot. And of course, I can reduce the B ripple, but then meaning that I'll be using less of the Vmax. So as we can see, there is a problem of using the amorphous material at high switching frequency. So here is my conclusion. The limiting factor is in fact the ripple of the magnetic flux density, not the maximum value. And here I'm showing the relationship uh, to the current and what should be the inductance for a given ripple. Now, once we know what is the ripple that we are going to work with, the magnetic flux density ripple, then we need B set, which is at least five times larger. If it is much more than that, we are not, not, not going to use it. So it's a waste. So the conclusion is that the amorphous cause at this point, as far as I can tell from the information I could find on the web, are effective at low switching frequency. There is a problem at high switching frequency. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. 
I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it of interest and it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.